Oh my god, there's a news flash on the confuser. Bleep, bleep, click, click. <gasps> Monies invested into eSport and e-racing using that thing that I'm familiar with. <gasps> Maybe I can cheat at this because it's not really designed for racing. I bet I should. Yeah, let's get started. Whee! Zwift is a piece of software that allows you to simulate your ride with a virtual avatar. In combination with a smart trainer that can adjust resistance on climbs, it creates a simple but effective virtual world that is a bit more fun. However, if you are a heavy user of Zwift, I'm sure you've heard someone talking about cheating. Cheating in Zwift is done in one of two ways, the user's weight or their power. The most common of these is weight cheating, where a user puts in a different weight, usually lower, to give them a climbing or acceleration advantage. The other cheating would be power. And power data comes from a smart trainer or a power meter. The second element is harder to fake for the average person, but it can be done. There is a new category of esports emerging, real cycle racing, but all in the comfort of your own home using your own power meter. The main problem is that the, the protocols and methods that existed when power meters were first developed never had competitive racing in mind. And that's okay because there can be solutions to this problem, but none of them exist today. I'm going to show you how I did this and talk about why I wasn't caught, even in a real race. First, who is this guy? Does he even know what he's talking about? Well, a little over six years ago, I started a blog that showed my journey to create cheaper power meters. After two years of work and a demo, I joined a company. After another year, we launched a product, and a year after that, we had a UCI World Pro team. I was fortunate enough to invent several concepts using multiple string gauge arrangements. So I've seen every aspect of development of three power meter designs. Most recently, I worked for a major group set company working in the electronics group. And all this time, I've been using and working with the same protocols, ANT Plus and BLE. So I've got about six plus years of understanding of these protocols, hardware, designs, calculations, and theory. So first, we're going to need some hardware to cheat with. I'm going to use a development board with some modified reference code to simulate a power meter. This could have been done just as easily on a computer, I'm just a little bit better with embedded. I didn't run this in Zwift much because I felt it was too easy to catch me, but honestly, nothing happened. Second, I added randomization of the power to make it look more like a real power meter. I used this to level up, gain access to higher areas, get faster bikes. I even used it once to Everest. And lastly, I added a heart rate simulator, which allowed me to race. I configured it to work with a replica Super Nest controller for ease of use. I was able to engineer my placement by watching my power on a cycle computer. At this point, I stopped because nobody had caught me. No emails, no contact, nothing. So let's talk a little bit about why I wasn't caught. So why wasn't Zwift or Zwift Power able to actually catch me? Well, it's actually kind of simple that on the Zwift side, they're only really looking at power meter data. And so long as they decode it and it looks correct, then there shouldn't be a problem. In fact, there's only a minimum necessary set of pages they, they must support in order to be fully compatible and compliant. So my power meter looks fully compliant. And that, for their side, they just want to ensure that people have a good experience. So they want that threshold, that barrier to entry to be the minimal. Zwift does decode a lot of the auxiliary data I found out, but it doesn't really have anything to do with it. It just looks at, looks at it, decodes it, and I know it decodes it because when you use certain manufacturing IDs, you will usually get a free jersey or something like that. The power data of a smart trainer once it's locked onto a current wattage, it just kind of looks like random Gaussian noise. They use, usually use the most basic of the power profiles because it's really all they need and allows them to transmit data at the highest possible speed. The downside to that is that it's very easy to fake. And not only that is it's very easy to fake while also looking like a real power meter. 
So on the Zwift Power side, the only thing I could find is the heart rate monitor. And it's funny because heart rate monitors are, are so algorithmic in nature and have s such a great variance uh, in their functionality on different peoples, the electrode-based ones and the optical ones. So they're both ran through algorithms. The electrode ones tend to be just ran through a pure algorithm so that their heart rate doesn't look like it's bouncing around constantly. The optical ones actually tend to use a lot of trickery, things like accelerometers and movements and estimation and, and some sort of prediction algorithms in order to figure it out because they lose track a lot more. So that, that all leads heart rate monitors as one of the easiest things to fix. So by mandating that you use them doesn't actually make any sense. So that's how I was able to pretty much fake my way through it. And right now, based on the way the standards are, I should be able to keep using this equipment even if they try and increase their technical requirements. Okay, so how was I able to cheat in all of these type of events and even races without being caught? Well, it's quite simple. The main problems are weight and power. With weight, the only method for checking right now is honesty. And if something is anomalous, if another user reports, then you might have a problem. The simple solution to this is a smart scale. There are, there are many, many solutions out there that are cheap. They all provide API access. So a race organization or company running some sort of e-race can easily connect to these APIs and get that data. Yes, some people won't have one of these, but at the low cost of 50 US dollars for some of the cheapest smart scales, it's quite easily attainable by someone who is going to have a direct force power meter. The other side of this is they're surprisingly accurate because of the limitations of, of where the force is, the gravity vector, and the simplicity of the, the sensing elements. They're actually easily within one or two percent for the most part. You'll obviously be able to find ones that are outside and ones that are, are worse or better, but they're generally pretty good. It's been brought to my attention that the scenario of pushing up on a table, essentially the idea would be that you push up on the table, you reduce your weight. And in that scenario, you may have all this data and then bloop, it drops out. And just before a race, and it may drop out again, and that's easily detectable, these, uh, these anomalous uh, drops in your data. But let's say someone only provided that data. Well, a lot of these smart scales auto-detect. So if they get two or three weigh-ins when a person's trying to match up that perfect number to stabilize the smart scale and get it to lock onto it, um, they may get multiple readings before they get the right one. And if they are pushed to the organizations rather than just pulled minutes or hours after the fact, then that becomes fairly easily detectable, but it's not a perfect system. It's just like you could have someone else come in and weigh themselves, or you could have someone else come in and ride the bike for you weighing yourself. So providing a method of validating that you are really you, um, the smart scale is actually not that far off, but it's still an imperfect system, just like anything. So it's, it's going to be a bit of a cat and mouse on constantly trying to chase these pieces of technology and making sure that they're validated for a racing environment. So when we come back to this whole reporting problem, if someone changes a power meter, if they change from a trainer that is reading high or reading low to a single-sided or to a, from a single-sided to a dual-sided or from a highly asymmetric single-sided arm that was on the top end to their low-end beater bike, which has low asymmetry but greater accuracy, um, it's really interesting to be able to confuse that someone's faking their power output with something's just not functioning correctly. So right now with power, if it works, if it produces data, if the data isn't ridiculously anomalous, you can use it. In terms of racing, the only requirement I've seen is you have to have a heart rate monitor, but I was easily able to fake that as well. And with heart rate monitors, they're so algorithmic in nature that the data is very easy to fake and very hard to spot because you can chalk it up to the algorithm. And algorithms work better on some people than others. So to solve this problem, third-party validation. 
So third party validation would work in a way such as a race organization through the software would send it a challenge code to a crank arm. If it gets the correct response back, it's good to go or bad. The way this needs to work is they need specific either AMP plus or BLE um, characteristics, so AMP plus pages, BLE characteristics that they can look up. So a third party company would then need to validate the crank arms, have defined that there has to be differentiation between one brand's crank model that their technology is on versus another, it becomes mandatory. And then when that happens, these things can then be validated, they can be disassembled, they can be tested on rigs, and they can have force applied in multiple directions, check their sensitivity. And if they pass that, their that model can then be put on a, a acceptable list for professionals, maybe a, a lower tier for amateur racing. But if a company was to ever do anything nefarious, such as they have crank models that pass and crank models that don't, well, they just put those codes into the ones that do pass, then they need to be blacklisted. Well, how you need to be able to do that is essentially you can't accept review samples, prototypes, uh, prototype firmware, beta firmwares, none of this. You have to buy them all retail. They can't be shipped from manufacturing suppliers and adhere to a method of obfuscating, making sure that the company doesn't know that you have their parameter to validate. When you do that, that's when you'll find defects because especially with the arm asymmetry, it's very easy for me to, to, to have a parameter and just tune it so that it works perfect for me almost all the time. But then if I give it to someone else, it won't. And I'm in a very small subset of categories on the style and the directions at which I apply force. So if it works for one person, it doesn't necessarily mean it works for another. So this is where a one reviewer writing multiple meters, they may always work. Every meter may always work for them. But in some cases, you might have someone who has a lot of cycling weirdness and they are, their power meters never work. So essentially you need to have requirements about force. You also need to have requirements about ease of installation and usage. If you can't put it on a bike and make it work all the time, that's going to be a problem. So mandatory calibration before races, logging that data helps, but with more and more power meters just sending go, no-go codes and not actual data about their strain gauges, that needs to kind of take a step back. We need to go back to sending more of that strain gauge data for the racing events. And you can then see things like, oh, your, your thermal calibration is off or something shifted or something did this and your power data is, is no longer valid. So why does this even matter? Who cares that I can cheat or someone else can cheat and you know climb the ranks in Zwift or, or fake a, a race result or do any of these things? Well, you have to look at this like a multiplayer video game that is competitive. So in uh, eSport, the traditional eSport, there are methods of detecting uh, cheating. So on computers for aim assist and those type of things. On cell phones, there are methods of detecting if you have a keyboard and mouse hooked up to a first person shooter in a competitive game. So we're in that category, but we're also in the traditional sport cheating category. So a lot of sports, especially endurance sports, have had a strong history of doping and have had strong histories of trying to get around doping. So under that, we just have to look at who's the stakeholders. Firstly, the platform devs. They don't actually have a strong interest in making sure that there's anti-cheating, as you would suspect. Not directly. They don't really care if you you are you know cheating or not. They still get their monthly fee. But they have a responsibility to everyone else. So theirs is a secondary stakeholder situation. But the other racers, even in regular multiplayer video games, there are people who complain about other people cheating. And it's that they may have a skill, they may be really good at it, but if someone just uses methods of cheating, it 
it lowers their, their feel and their experience, but it also tends to push them out of that game. It tends to drive them away from the platform. So the real people who are going to have any care about this is the racers and the race organizers. So if you're a racer or a race organizer, this is important to you. Because for racers, you might be able to beat that guy outside 100% of the time, or you might be able to climb a hill faster than, than everyone you know, but then you go on a trainer and if their trainer reads 10 or 15% higher, or they juice their calibration factors, or they do anything like this, intentional or unintentional, you'll end up losing. And that again drives you away from the platform, but also makes sure you lose respect for that platform because you don't have a competitive advantage because you didn't buy the right equipment. And in this case, the right equipment can actually be the lower accuracy equipment. So that means that like the general riders, the racers need it to be accurate, but you can't rely on them to understand the ins and outs of all of their equipment. If everyone could do that who rode a bike, everyone would either have a power meter or have built their own power meter, and they have not. So you can't really rely on the racer to understand the perfect inner outs of their equipment. I mean, lots of people have to bring their bike to a shop to lube their chain. And it's, it's quite fair. I think that's a fair requirement. The race organizers, then, they have the greatest onus because if they lose racers, and that means there's less engagement, they have less potential for profit. They're still probably working on how to profit off of this e-racing, but those are the ones with the highest stakeholders because they lose racers, they lose viewers, they lose engagement. If you're a race organizer, this should be near the top of things that you're talking with people about. And for the platform devs, they just got to know to look out and here are some solutions. All right, Shimano D-Fly, I'm going to reverse engineer you even if I have to blow up another one of these, all with the help of an $8 logic analyzer. The hobbyist community seems to constantly use terrible analog-to-digital converters for low voltages and things like strain gauges. Well, not anymore. Gotta... Ah, uh, it plugs in somehow. Ah, uh, uh, damn it.